It's time for Arts This Week, your download of the latest arts and culture events in and around Boston. Boston has come into its own as a public art city. Each of its neighborhoods now punctuated in artistic moments, from show-stopping murals to sculpture waiting to catch your eye. Public art creates identity. Yes, we can delight or be moved by what we see, but we also know that there's an artist or a group of them sharing a story, a perspective, or maybe their hopes for the community. Think of it as a conversation. There's now such a proliferation of public art that digital artist Julia Swanson has crafted the Art Walk Project, a guide introducing us to art populating six neighborhoods including East Boston, Chinatown, and South Boston. It features maps, titles, and artist names. Her charted tours are free and self-guided. There was a time not all that long ago when I yearned for Boston to be a public art destination like Chicago or New York. Now, with public art increasingly woven into the city's fiber, it appears we may have arrived at our destination, or hopefully the first of many stops. The late two-time Pulitzer Prize winning playwright August Wilson committed himself to what came to be known as the Century Cycle, plays examining black life in each decade of the 20th century. The second work he wrote in that series is Joe Turner's Come and Gone, and there is a magnificent production playing now at the Huntington Theater. Tell me about them bones here, Loomis. Tell me what you're going to It takes place in a Pittsburgh boarding house in 1911, a time when black men and women are free, but the ravages of slavery and the insidious ways it still creeps into society are present. Wilson's boarding house setting is wonderfully rich. There is a community of regulars, family really, who love to spar and joke and be introspective. But the community's energy churns with every newcomer, toting their literal and metaphorical baggage. Chief among them is Harold Loomis, who arrives with his young daughter. He is bent and brooding, carrying a deep darkness, or as one of the other boarding house denizens describes, he's a man who forgot his song. Wilson's portraiture is exceptional, as we move deeper into each boarding house character, watching as they, with their disparate backgrounds and personalities, bang and bond together. The Huntington production is a stunner, charged with electricity as the layers of Loomis's past are revealed to us. And when it arrives, that revelation is an emotionally explosive one. At its core is actor James Millward. His nuanced, mysterious, and raw performance of Loomis is one I will likely never forget. This is a golden time to visit the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. It's presenting the largest gathering of shimmering work by Italian Renaissance artist Simone Martini ever assembled in the U.S. In the 1300s, Martini was a painter to popes, princes, and aristocracy. He commemorated Christian figures and themes in halos and ornaments of gold. 700 years later, his manipulation of gold is still entrancing. The intricate shading and etching, how he used gold for glow, for glistening, or to toss around light. The exhibition then launches us from Martini's golden age to three contemporary artists using the metal to their own effect. They are Kahinde Wiley, whom you might recall for his portrait of President Barack Obama, Stacey Lynn Waddell, and Titus Kaffar. Kaffar uses gold in a series of portraits of black men titled The Jerome Project. They're all men with the same first and last name who've been incarcerated. Their faces made radiant by a Martini-esque arc of gold. What we can see of their faces, that is, because Kafar also uses tar to swallow their images. The amount of tar corresponding to the length of their incarceration. The entire exhibition is energizing for the way in which it refuses to allow the Renaissance works to remain relics of the past. How they're instead a channel which today's artists are putting to use with an urgency and immediacy.
This has been an era in which we're re-examining history, recognizing the stories and people whose lives, work, and contributions have frequently been excluded. It's fitting, then, that the Concord Museum, which is literally situated at the center of so much of the country's history, should complete its recent renovation and expansion with a more expansive look back. You will still find Ralph Waldo Emerson's chair and Louisa May Alcott's tea kettle, but also the looking glass of an enslaved person, a sculptural representation of indigenous people's legacy by Native American artists. The Concord Museum has a dizzying array of artifacts from the country's early days and its foundational thinkers. The clock that kept time during the shot heard round the world, which still chimes, new period rooms, and a fascinating look at Concord's second revolution. People like Frederick Douglass eyed Concord's conclave of thinkers as a bastion for the abolitionist movement. It might be a cliché to say that history is alive here, but at the very least, it is revived. Now my pick for what to see next week, a show cleverly summed up in the lyrics, Divorced, Beheaded, Died, Divorced, Beheaded, Survived. Six, the Tony-winning musical about the six wives of Henry VIII, opens at the Emerson Colonial Theater, and in the guise of pop stars, these queens have a lot to say. This is your Arts Download. I'll see you back here and at six next week.